Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Event-driven architecture has a few gotchas. Things that you always need to be thinking about or aware of. So regardless if you're new to event-driven architecture or a seasoned veteran, these things just don't go away. Let me cover four different aspects of event-driven architecture that you're always gonna need to think about. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, in event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So the first thing to cover is at least once delivery or at least once semantics. And the idea here being is that a consumer for a message may actually get a message, the same message, more than once. And this could be the broker's fault, but this actually in other situations can be the publisher's fault. But regardless of who faults that is in terms of actually getting a message more than once, you just need to be prepared for it and you need to build consumers in a way that they can handle getting the same message more than once because there could be implications there. So how does this work from a, a broker's point of view? When you have your publisher, um, it sends a message to your broker and then from there you have one or many different consumers or zero um, consume that actual message. Now the way that some brokers work, not all of them, is that they require you to acknowledge that you've processed the message. And from there they know, okay, I won't give you back that same message. But usually here there's some timeout, maybe you have an exception you're not able to acknowledge, or maybe you're using a library and it auto acknowledges for you. But the idea here is that you have your consumer request back to the broker to tell it, okay, I process this message, I acknowledge it, um, don't process that, don't send that message anymore, we're good. So the problem here happens if you get that message and you're consuming it, but there's set generally some type of timeout that requires you to, to acknowledge within a given window of time. And if you don't do that, the broker assumes that it needs to re-deliver that message. So if you're processing that message and you don't acknowledge it after whatever that timeout is, it could potentially resend you that message, which means you're gonna to try to process it again. So another reason this can happen is from the publisher, is that a publisher may publish the exact same message more than once. And I've covered a reason why using the outbox pattern in a separate video. But it may be because the publisher actually publishes a different message just with the same actual content, the properties within it. So maybe it's a different message ID, but the properties of the message and the message type are exactly the same. Under either scenario, whether it's from the broker re-delivering a message or whether it's a publisher publishing the same message more than once, you need to be able to have your consumers either be aware that they need to be item potent or that they need to keep track of what messages that they're actually processing. Under certain circumstances, maybe your consumer is naturally item potent, meaning that if it processes a message, uh, a same message more than once, that's totally fine and there's no ill consequence from that. Under other situations, that may have some seriously negative impacts on your system if it processes a message more than once. So the gotcha here is that you need to be aware when you're building your consumers that what the consequences are if the public if you process a message more than once because with at least one semantics or because of your publisher publishing the same message more than once it can be it can happen that you're going to have to deal with duplicate messages so the second gotcha is being aware of where you're actually publishing events in your code and that events become first class in your system so to illustrate this i'm using a shipment example and you could think of this as like food delivery where you have somebody that goes and picks up food at a restaurant and then delivers it to your house apartment or wherever you're delivering that food. So kind of the transition here, the first thing that happens kind of in that process is the person who's picking up your food arrives at the restaurant. So I have this transaction script that's uh, having that's using a command, to process a command. It has some different logic, uh, business logic. And then once that passes, it's doing a state change here. It's setting the status to arrived and then setting this arrived date time of when that actually occurred. And then we're saving that back, that state back to our database. And then we're publishing an event of arrived, this arrived event. And we could have some various consumers that are picking up this arrived event so they can do different things, like maybe sending a push notification out to your mobile app so that your customer, whoever ordered the food, uh, knows that they're the driver is actually at the restaurant. There could be a variety of reasons, even internal to your system. But again, when an arrive happens, this event needs to be published. So the gotcha here is you need to be aware when you make certain state transitions 
and events are being published, that that happens everywhere. And you need to design your code this way so that you don't go off course of being able to make state transitions in other parts of your system and that event doesn't get published because that can have implications. As an example here, I have this uh, pickup command. So this is in the next part of the state transition where the, you've arrived at the restaurant, now you've actually picked up the food and you're on your way to deliver that food. So I have some logic here that states, well, if you haven't done the arrive, then we'll just automatically set that date time of the arrive to when we're actually doing the pickup and we're departing. And then we'll make our rest of our state transition here, we'll save our changes and we'll publish the pickup event. But we've actually kind of merged the arrive and the pickup together, but we've never even published the arrive event. This can have implications. You can't just make state changes possibly uh, without publishing the event. So the answer to kind of this issue is that we have two different transaction scripts where this isn't the optimal design. But again, there's other ways around this. I've done a video on aggregate routes and where business logic should go. I'll have kind of a link up here. But again, the gotcha here is being realized that events are first class. When you make certain state transitions and you're publishing an event that is basically illustrating that fact that that happened, you need to do it everywhere. So don't sprinkle events everywhere that you're making state transitions for every um, every particular action, you wanna consolidate things into a narrow focus of where you're actually publishing events for very specific commands or things that have happened within your system. So the third gotcha, which really piggybacks off the last, which is you cannot bypass your API because your API, your app service, is actually making state changes and publishing events. Again, events are first class and you cannot make a state change without publishing the event. So let's say we have our client, it makes a request to our app service, we make some type of state change, then we publish our event. We cannot have some other app service, including yourself as a developer, to jump online to some tool that you have to connect your database to manually fix data, because if you do that, you're bypassing your API. You potentially are making state changes that aren't gonna be represented by publishing an event. So this cannot happen. You cannot manually update data or fix data by bypassing your API. Again, your events become first class. They need to be published when certain state transitions happen. So to quickly illustrate this, I'm using events for cache invalidation. So if we have some requests to our database that makes a state transition, and then we have our message broker, we publish that message, and we're also then going to consume that message so that asynchronously, we can then go and update our cache. Again, this is all bu built through events in our publish subscribe. If we made changes to our database directly, that event would never get published and we would never be invalidating the cache. So again, there's many different implications that can have by not publishing an event, but this illustrates one of them. So the last gotcha I wanna talk about are failures and how they have an impact to processing times and can have a series of cascading effects on your consumers. So to illustrate this, I have a broker where we're processing some type of message now, the thing is, is that if you have a consumer, just to illustrate this, that let's say it needs to make a, a network call over the network to some external service. Say we're making an HTTP call to some other ex external service that we have. Now, depending on how reliable that external service is, we can have implications in terms of it failing when we make that call, or maybe it has a really long timeout and it's taking a really long time to actually even make that request. So how we wanna handle that failure can have giant implications on processing times and backlogging our queue potentially. So by this, we need to have different strategies for fault tolerance. There are things like having immediate retries where we can say, okay, when that service is down, we're just gonna immediate retry because maybe it's a transient issue and that can totally work fine. Maybe there's other scenarios where, okay, if that external service is down, we don't wanna keep retrying this. We don't want to ha have that consumer deal with just this one message. We need to move on, process other messages. So we'll just push it to a dead letter queue. And it could be a combination of these things where you backed off, you retry again, nope, still failing. Okay, let's push that, push that message to our dead letter queue. But every time you're building a consumer, this gotcha is in place that you need to be aware of what are the implications and the processing times that you think um, that consumer processing that message should have. If there's gonna be a long delay, 
What implications does that have to your overall processing other messages from that broker? So anytime you're dealing with kind of IO or external services um, that you may have a long time out, like I said, maybe it's an HTTP request, you need to be thinking about, okay, that request, should we time out that request? What's kind of a, a good length of time that we can, a threshold that we can wait for that, that request to finish? If it's too long, then we bail out and throw the message to a dead letter queue if possible. Or we have different metrics for alarming on how long things are processing. But again, kind of how you want to handle failures and their implications with processing time is again, one of these gotchas that you're always thinking about. So hopefully this illustrated some of the gotchas and things that you're going to be thinking about and aware of when you're using an event-driven architecture. How do you want to handle duplicate messages? How do you want to design code so that when you make a state change, you're publishing the required event? Realizing that if you circumvent your API, you're not going to be publishing an event. And thinking about your consumers and fault tolerance and their processing times and the latency around it. Solutions or ways of handling all these gotchas I've covered in other videos, so make sure to check some of these out. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.